show because uh, I mean there is this uh, science fiction uh, movie festival and you've seen a lot of movies right now. Uh, well, actually, I have only seen th three. So three? Uh, yeah. Okay, but what do you think is the future of the uh, genre and science fiction as a writer and also as a person involved in uh, TV series and uh, who likes movies? I guess. <laughs> Oh well, well, I mean, I think the the future is very bright, actually, for in terms of of science fiction, certainly, uh, because we have finally all my life uh, science fiction fans, including myself, have been complaining that we're not taken seriously and that no one will let us into the mainstream. We've been kept out of the party, you know, and that's just gone. Uh, you know, it, it, I think it it has been going. It's been failing for a while now, but it, but that's gone. It, it's gone definitively now. The mainstream is science fiction. I mean, if you look at the the, the all the blockbuster films that are coming out with, uh, you know, obviously with the, the Marvel universe movies and so forth. But also, if you look at the, the more serious work that's being done, uh, you constantly see science fictional tropes being used, uh, and writers are increasing. Novelists like myself. I'm in genre anyway, but increasingly mainstream novelists are writing novels that basically are science fiction. And I think basically what's happened is that the technology, the wave of technology is moving so fast now, we, we are living in a science fictional age. Uh, the, you know, the things that we, you know, the, the phones in our pockets, they would have been considered science fiction probably only 10 years ago. Uh, and that, that, is, uh, that, that, that is increasing. Pretty soon they'll, we'll have access to things that only, maybe only five years ago we thought were science fictional dreams. So I think what's happened is that, yes, generally speaking, as a, as a global culture, as a species, we've moved into a, a space that is science fictional. And science fiction is really the only, it's the only usable reference point. So if you are a, ro a novelist, for example, or a filmmaker, and you want to say something significant about the times we live in, you have to, at a minimum, you've got to accept the rules of engagement of science fiction. Because you aren't, you aren't going to be able to address it otherwise. Uh, you know, the stories, if you want to tell stories about now, those stories in, are going to feel like science fiction because of this advancing wave of, of you know, change and, and technological progress. And for guys like me, that's great. You know? um, and yeah, there's, a, there's a, a level of acceptance now right the way across the board. Uh, it's, it's moving up the generations. Uh, I think uh, video games have had a lot to do with it as well. I think the video game industry has kind of... Because gaming, I mean, science fiction and fantasy are the, the, the twin engines of gaming. By definition, games are about making things happen on screen. And there are two ways you can do that. You can do it through technology uh, or you can do it through magic. Those are the two tools that will allow the game to, to function. So the gaming industry has never really cared about this slightly snobbish attitude to, to genre. And... Uh, and the games industry now, I mean, everyone plays games, you know. I doubt, if you go, I, I su suspect that you would really struggle to find a European under the age of 30 who can't use a PlayStation controller. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's uh, a few years ago that was anyone under 20, but let's say we're moving up. When I started working for Electronic Arts back in 2008, uh, they said to me that I was unusual because I was a, a writer in my early 40s. And they said there weren't many guys like me who were uh, who knew games, you know, who were comfortable with gaming. And I was surprised because I said, well, I, you know, and then I thought about the other writers I know who play games. And I thought, yes, actually, they are all a little bit younger than me. Uh, and now, though, I mean, I'm in my 50s now, so those guys are, are in their 40s. So I say, I think we've got to the stage where almost everybody is plugged into the, the gaming universe. Uh, and with that has come this mainstream acceptance across the board. And I say it, plus the other thing is, yes, this, this need to cope with the world we live in. And about uh, time passing by, I mean, your novel, has, you wrote it uh, like 10 years ago. Or more 20 years ago. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, and um, right now it's a TV series, so mm -hmm. a lot of things changed. What do you think uh, when they adapted it? I mean, uh, did you want to change something because the time passed? No, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm very laissez-faire when it comes to these things. I mean, you know, if someone comes and says, we would like to make a movie or a TV show or a game out of your book, as far as I'm concerned, it's like, okay, off you go. Uh, you know, it's, it's not mine to control. Uh, Lita Calagridis, who was the, the showrunner for Altered Carbon, she also was, she's been a champion of the book for many, many years. 
Uh, she was very keen to get me involved. She, my contract specified that I'd be involved as a consultant on the show, and they made good on that. I mean, it wasn't a formality that it, they, they, you know, I was sent the early scripts to review. Uh, I got to see casting videos of the various actors. She sent me suggestions for various characters. Who do you think would play this well? Here are the possible choices. So, I went out to Vancouver and I met the the cast and. Wandered about the sets, so I was involved, and they listened to me. Uh, but obviously, I'm not an expert in movie making or TV shows, so they listened to me, and then they took what they could use from what I said, and the stuff that they couldn't use because you know it was it didn't make sense in the context. They obviously just went, yeah, okay, thank you for that, and <laughs> uh, and put it aside. And I, I'm comfortable with that. I, you know, I you can't hold on to things when they when they cross. The barrier between media. Uh, a book is not a movie and a movie is not a game and a game is not a comic and all these different forms have their own rules and their own requirements and it has to change. You can't possibly take something from one medium and just boom, turn it into a different medium. You, By definition it has to be modified to, to to cross the barrier successfully, and I've always known that. I, uh, you know, I've done some work in other media. I say I've worked in the games industry. I've written comics. Uh, I've done a little bit of screenwriting now, uh, now and then, uh, and I know that the requirements are different. So I was very, I was very relaxed about the changes that they were going to make. And what was quite instructive was that in at least one case, it was a change that I didn't like, which turned out to be massively, massively successful when the show came out. Uh, in, in the book. The AI hotel that uh, Kovacs stays in was the Hendrix Hotel, and the avatar was Jimi Hendrix, and that was just because of some stuff that I had in my own life, and it, you know, I wanted to express that. Uh, we, when it came to the show, they couldn't get the permission of the Jimi Hendrix estate to do that, so they had to think of something else, and we went through a whole series of different possible options for that hotel, and in the end, they settled on this idea of the Raven Hotel, and okay, so the avatar will be uh, Edgar Allan Poe. And it kind of works because Edgar Allan Poe, some people would say, invented the detective novel. So, you know, there was a resonance there. And I didn't like it at the time. I, I, I was like, ah, I don't know, this, this isn't, I, I don't like it. It's not going to work. Uh. And of course it did. It really, really worked. Uh, it was the composition, the, the, the art design, uh, Chris Connor taking the character of, of uh, Poe and really running with it. All of that was massively successful. I mean, it, it really worked on screen, and people fell in love with it. They they really fell in love with it. And now I'm forced mm -hmm. to look at my hotel in the in the book and the hotel that that Lita came up with for the show, and say actually hers is better. You know, this, this was a really good choice. It was a, a decision. And if I had been on the committee that was ruling on these things. I would have said no. I would have. I would have said no. I don't like that. So this is the thing. You must be aware of your own limitations. You know. I, I like to think I'm a good novelist. I don't know very much about, or if anything, about making TV shows. Uh, so you, the, you need a certain amount of humility. You have to accept that the people you're talking to know the the ground better than you do, and you have to defer to that. And it took so much, so much time to adapt uh, the novel because. Uh, uh, they talk about some movies before doing the TV shows. So why do you think it happens that it takes so much time? Do you think that maybe right now Netflix and the other streaming platform gives more freedom, for example? Or do you think it's just uh, it, that it takes uh, more courage? I think one of, I mean, it's, it's a number of, it's not a single thing, it's a number of things. Uh, one of the things is, I think, that yes, with Netflix and HBO and the whole concept of, of long-form TV, it's become possible to do uh, screen, screen fiction, which is, for want of a better word, novelistic. It really is. When you look at, not just my show, but I mean, when you look at things like uh, The Sopranos or Ozark or uh, uh, The Haunting of Hill House most recently that I've been watching, and, and these are novelistic, that's the feel to them. They have the time and the pacing to examine individual characters, to, to really work the themes over and over again. The feeling you get from watching 10 hours of, of um, TV you know, from a, a streaming show is very much the feeling you get from reading a novel. So in that sense, I think the whole paradigm has shifted because when you were constrained to two hours of movie, then 
there was a limit to what you could do because there is no book in the world that will make a two-hour movie without some massive changes. And one of the reasons that Altercom didn't get made as a movie was because even when Lita Calagridis was trying to get it made, her scripts were too long. So she was she was trying not to sacrifice anything that was in, she felt was important in the in the book, and so her first script that came in was like three hours twenty minutes. And there's no one in Hollywood who could get the budget <coughs> to make a, to make a, a Hollywood movie of three hours and twenty minutes. I mean, it, it's you know not a genre movie. That's just not possible. So she went back. She cut. It came down to something like two hours forty. There are maybe. I don't know, two or three directors in the world who could persuade the studio to come up with the money you would need to make a big budget science fiction movie with special effects and, and so forth that is two hours and 40 minutes long. And again, we couldn't get them. They were all busy. So, <laughs> uh, And that's the thing. I, I think, in a sense, what happened was that the, the streaming thing came along and it, it enabled a new approach to the material, which could not have happened in the 90s. Uh, I mean, you know, the book, the book was optioned uh, in 2002 uh, by Warner Brothers. And at the time, I thought the movie would get made pretty fast. But I also knew that the movie would be a very pale imitation of the book. I mean, it would just be two hours of CGI. It was going to be something like a Matrix movie, I guess. Uh, and, yeah, I think, in a sense, I mean, although I would have loved that movie to get made because it would have been great for me, personally, you know, obviously the book would have sold a lot and would have been great publicity. But I know that that movie, honestly, probably wouldn't have been very good. Uh, or it might have been a good movie, but in its own right, it would not have been a decent uh, translation of, of, of the book. And I think, yeah, what's changed is now we have the wherewithal to make these books into movie, into shows that do them justice. So, yeah, that's, that's part of it, I think, certainly. Uh, the other thing is determination. I mean, Lita Calagridis tried to option the book in 2002, she missed the boat and it got optioned by uh, Warner Brothers instead. And obviously Warner Brothers are a big studio, she couldn't compete with that. She, you know, they, they just had, I mean, they paid me a lot of money. Um, and, uh, but she said at the time to my Hollywood agent, she said, look, when this finally falls out of option, because it will, because they don't understand how to make this, they won't be able to make this into a film, she said, then come and talk to me. And sure enough, I mean, Warner's, Warner Brothers were great. I mean, they kept it for seven years before they finally said, look, this is not happening. And the minute that it fell out of option, Lita Calabridis was there, immediately ringing, saying, right, yeah, I will take it. I will option it because I know what to do with this. Uh, and she took it in 2010. And for, well, what is that? The best part of five years, she tried to turn it into a movie. And she did everything she could to make it happen. Uh, and it didn't happen. Uh, she, there was just no way to, to, to drive it forward. And in most cases, most Hollywood operators will, will just go, OK, thanks very much, bye. You know, and, and they will just walk away and go and look for another project. And she didn't. She just said, all right, well, if I can't do this as a, as, as a movie, right, can I do it as TV instead? And so she went and talked to people that she knew, and she got brokered the deals, and she got the show made. But, but it took the stubbornness and the, the, the determination to, to the, I want to see this, this book realised as a vision on screen, to push for, yeah, seven years to make that happen. You know? And I, I was just as very lucky that I got her as, a, you know, as, as the, the driving force behind it, rather than somebody else who, you know, not because they're a bad developer or a bad producer, but simply because they just don't have that, that passion. And yeah, after three years of not being able to do it, they just turn around and say, okay, sorry, Richard, this isn't happening. Bye. You know? so, so partly, yes, things have changed, times have changed, the paradigms have shifted, but also it's about your luck. And I got lucky because I got someone who was passionate about the project and absolutely determined not to, to let it go. And I, you know, I'm forever indebted, I really am. I have a last question. You said you worked also for comics and for Marvel, mm. and there is a lot of love and hate uh, for cine comic in the in the industry. Also from uh, directors who said that are killing the the movies and the art in a way. <laughs> so, what's your opinion? And uh, what's your opinion on uh, uh, the new shift uh, towards the female projects like Black Widow or Captain Marvel? I I think it's it, we're getting there. But very, very slowly. Uh, you know, the, the, the Marvel Universe machine, uh, 
uh, because it is a machine now. I mean, it's you know, it it, it spans media. It's it, it's incredibly powerful. It's a massive, dynamic system. Uh, it isn't of you know of necessity. It's conservative because if you want to appeal to large audiences, you you you've got to stay conservative. Most people don't like change. Most people don't like fresh things. They sometimes, especially in in genre, they sometimes think that they do. They you know, they think they like new things, but the truth is when you actually show them something new, they don't like it. Uh, so Marvel are, want to make money. They want, they want their films to, to do well. They, they, God knows it costs a lot to make a Marvel movie, so you know, they've got to get the money back. Uh, and so they will, they will always make sure that they're shooting for um, a nice, big, mainstream demographic. And yeah, those people are conservative. Those people so will not be easily persuaded that things should change, that women, there should be more women protagonists, that the women should have more agency in, in the stories, that we should have a diversity of, of um, superheroes, you know, of all colours, races and, and persuasions. This all takes time to, 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 to push across. But I think there are plenty of people with their hearts in the right place within the Marvel engine. And, and yes, you've seen, I mean, obviously Black Panther is the the evidence of that, and also the, the evidence for me, the, the thing, thing that I find very heartening is that Black Panther was not just successful with you know the African American community, but it was a massive smash hit everywhere. You know, everybody loved it. It wasn't it wasn't just African Americans going to see that show. It was everybody went to see it. White kids loved it. You know, Halloween's just gone, and everyone, all these all these white kids saying, "I want to dress up as as Black Panther." You know, so. You can get there. It is possible to, 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 to move in that direction. But it's this big machine, and you can't... You know, it's not an Alfa Romeo. <laughs> it's a battleship, and you can't just... Turn, so we're going down this road now. Whoa! It takes miles and miles and miles to turn a vessel this big, to, to, to actually make it go in, in, in a new direction. And I think you have to be a little bit sanguine about it. You have to accept that you've got to wait for the pressures to build and to push, and eventually, slowly, we start to move in a better direction. I think we are moving in a better direction. There's no question. You know, uh, I am seeing much more female agency in in, the, in genre fiction. It's it's starting to to come together, but at the same time, there are people who are very resistant, both within the fan base and within the industry. And yeah, I mean, when I was writing Black Widow, I ran up against a lot of a lot of resistance to what I was doing. Uh, they weren't comfortable with this violent woman at all. Uh, and they're still not, really. I mean, the, the Black Widow on screen that you see on screen is still fundamentally a fanboy's wank fantasy. You know, it's tits and ass in a black leather cat suit, spike heels, beautiful hair. Uh, you know, and that sells. You know, that's, that, ha that has always sold. <laughs> uh, so it's no surprise that they go with that. My Black Widow was older, tougher, um, very often wrong. She very often did things that were unacceptable or you know made mistakes, um, and she was very much a person. I was very much a, I wanted to make her a genuine woman uh, rather than a confection, rather than a you know sort of a porn uh, model. Uh, and we're getting there with that as well. That will happen slowly. You are starting to see more of a nuanced take on what what female superheroes look like. But you'll always have the Neanderthals. You'll always have the troglodytes. You're always going to have this kind of huge conservative drag on on the industry uh, because that's the way people are you know and and comics have always been a boys club in the west anyway obviously if you go and look at manga and anime it's a whole other story but in the western world and especially in america comics have always been a boys club and we're very slowly starting to s squeeze some women into the boys club you know to push them in they're getting in through the back door they're getting in through the windows and very slowly, you know, one day we'll wake up and it won't be a boys' club anymore, you know. But it's going to take time. It's, it's, you, you can't make these things happen suddenly. Um, you just got to, you just got to work away at it slowly. You know, tap, tap away. And uh, I, as I say, I would love to see uh, my Black Widow on the screen, but that isn't going to happen any time soon. You know, uh, I'm very much aware of that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, you're very welcome. <laughs>